hi everyone. It's Hugo Bound Anderson here um, from Out of Bounds. I'm so excited to be here today and to have you here for our fireside chat um, about an introduction to Kubernetes for data scientists um, with uh, Brian Galvin and uh, Sri uh, Javadeka. Um, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. I would love it in the meantime if you introduced yourself in the chat uh, and let us know where you're calling in from. Uh, or where you're watching from, what your interest in Kubernetes and data science is, what you do, where you work, all of these types of things. Um, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Welcome everyone. Uh, Hugo Ban Anderson here from Metaflow and Out of Bounds. Uh, we have Everton joining from Brazil, which is great. And we have Dean Jay, who's given us an emoji of um, a planet surrounded by a ring. So this may be a clue. Dean may be from Saturn. Um, I don't know whether that means Dean works at, at Saturn Cloud, but if, if he is, hey Dean, uh, great to see you here. And it's been, been a long time. Um, we have Michael Wexler from New Jersey, USA. Um, great. So, um, and this is actually super important. This is, oh, this is wonderful. This is one of the reasons we're here today. Michael says that between gigs, um, and Michael hasn't enjoyed Kubernetes and Docker. So want to learn about how to make them, make them work. Um, fantastic uh, reasoning. Um, we, oh, great. We have Bob, who I met on Monday. Uh, so I mean, we're both in Austin for SciPy, who's a solution architect for Red Hat in Austin. Um, and he's interested in deploying uh, Metaflow on OpenShift and um, enjoyed the workshop that Savin Goyle and I taught yesterday. Um, we also have Raja from Houston. Um, Yuri, a uh, machine learning engineer at a startup in the Bay Area working on modeling and algorithmic development who's curious to learn more about infra for serving, serving their models. Um, we have people now from Bangladesh and, and Montreal. This is really cool. So we're getting a, a lot of representation from from around the globe. So thank you all so much for, for joining. Um, we'll just wait one or two more minutes and then we'll get started. But if um, you can continue to introduce yourself in the chat, that'd be great. And then we'll jump in to um, everything you always wanted to know about Kubernetes, but were too afraid to ask. All right. Well, without further ado, I think it's it's time to to get get started. Um, Brian and Shree, if you wouldn't mind coming out from the wings um, and sharing your cameras, your beautiful faces. Um, <laughs> how are you both? Uh, really, really good. Um, glad uh, we're doing it this week instead of the original time because I had a rather unfortunate mustache uh, that I, I'm glad that <laughs> beer started to grow back. <laughs> well, I like that your solution, I, as from one bearded man to another, um, that the solution isn't to shave off the mustache, but to grow out the beard. Yeah. Um, well, well in, in, in the interest of kind of sort of making sure that there is representation from everyone. Exactly. From from one uh, unmustached and unbearded person, I'm super excited to be here and really, you know, look forward to this conversation about Kubernetes and data science. And hopefully someday we'll have machine learning models actually telling us about how to grow mustaches mm -hmm. and, and, and beards. 
Absolutely. I, I like that. I actually, um, and this is slightly tangential, but I, I mentioned to someone last, we we're talking about Disneyland and I actually spoke with an ML engineer at Disneyland a while ago who their job, it's not beard related, but it's definitely image, image related. You know, when you go down, go like on, on rides at Disneyland, they'll like take a photo of you to give you afterwards. Um, yeah. Part of this person's job was to detect uh, write algorithms that detected obscene gestures um, in <laughs> these in, in these photos. Because of course, people when you go down, people like teenagers, teenagers these days, right? But mm. teenage, well, whoever. <laughs> I don't want to be ages, right? Um, but people will, will will do obscene things. But that's that's all for another day. And we've got a few more people. We've got some um, Atalaba from um, Angola. We have um, Edgar from Armenia. Mohammed from from Egypt. So there are people from all around the globe joining today. I'm also glad we didn't do it um, a, a couple of weeks ago um, because I, I was, I had a fever and it would have, it would have been an, an akin to some form of crazy LLM hallucination, I feel. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to just um, welcome everyone once again. Um, and um, as you join, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Um, the obligatory, if this is something you, you enjoy as well, please like the video and subscribe and share with friends. That's how we spread the word about all, all the things that we, we do. Um, we're also having, um, uh, yes, ask any questions throughout and we'll try to get to them. If we're unable to, um, come and join us in our community, community Slack. And I'm pasting the link there. We'll have an asynchronous Ask Me Anything AMA up afterwards in a channel called AMA Guests, but we'll point you point you to that. Um, and um, maybe it's worthwhile just saying a bit about Out of Bounds, where I work and who's hosting this this fireside chat. So we we work, and part of the reason for this chat is we work on infrastructure and productivity tools for data scientists and machine learning engineers um, that allow them to focus on building models and doing actual science while having easy access to infrastructural layers, such as compute, orchestration, versioning, all of these things. Um, we do this a great deal through the open source framework Metaflow at the moment, um, but we're also excited to be working on a, a platform. And if you're interested in that, you can um, check out our, our website as well. Um, if you're interested in these types of ideas, please do, I'll paste the link to um, the GitHub repository of the Metaflow project. Please do check it out. Um, and, and give it a star if that's something that interests you as well. Um, so that was all just a bit of, bit of bookkeeping. Um, I'm really excited to be here with two people who work in the space who I admire a, a great deal. And um, Brian works on machine learning infrastructure at Best Egg, but has a rich history across different, different parts of, well, different parts of the world um, and, and, and different verticals, having previously been director of data science at the LA Times, um, co-founder and CTO at Priceflow, which was acquired by Truecar, where he then became director of ML. Um, and before that, uh, Brian worked on machine learning at Netflix. Um, and something that's exciting for me and that I hope we'll discuss at the intersection of R and Python. And um, R, the programming language, with my accent, mm -hmm. um, R sounds like what the doctor says, <laughs> asks you to do. Um, <laughs> when he's te viewing your tonsils or whatever's happening there. And um, it's with great, great pleasure that um, we have here, for me anyway, um, Sri Javadeka, who is one of, I'm, I don't know if I've told you this, Sri, but you are one of my Kubernetes heroes. Um, in, in, in terms of making Kubernetes accessible to a, a, someone with a science background like, like myself. Every time we chat about Kubernetes, I, and among many other things, I, I, I learn a lot. It's something that I personally find impenetrable um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so you, you tend to break it down really well, which is one of the reasons I'm, I'm excited to have you here today. Um, everyone, Shri has worked as a software engineer previously at Dell and Intuit, um, also co-founder and head of engineering at, at, at Novus Labs and is now a software engineer here at Out of Bounds. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, a lot of exciting things happening. Um, so I'm going to share two links before we get started. And these are two blog posts that I think, if you haven't seen, um, are very interesting. One is by Chip Huen um, called Why Data Scientists Shouldn't Need to Know Kubernetes. 
Okay. The other one is by Hamel Hussein. Oh, I didn't even pay. I just, and it's called Why Should ML Engineers Learn Kubernetes? So they're actually two, they're compatible, but two kind of different takes on whether data scientists need to know anything about Kubernetes. And my, um, I suppose, hot take um, is that data scientists shouldn't need to know anything about Kubernetes, but they kind of do. I mean, things that should happen aren't things that do happen. And what I mean by that is, depending on what your tasks are, what your role is, what, what your job is, even though you shouldn't, maybe it's a bit helpful to sometimes. And so we're going to dive into um, kind of the things that would be useful to know. But on top of that, I'm talk about how we think about building tools that abstract away infrastructure such as Kubernetes. So at Metaflow, and Shri is going to give a, 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 a yeah. demo um, in the second half here. Um, you know, we have an at Kubernetes decorator, which, which once your cluster is provisioned, allows a data scientist to send any parts of their workflow to Kubernetes without necessarily understanding um, too, mm -hmm. too, too much about it. So we're going we're gonna to jump in in a second and um, we're going to talk about what Kubernetes is, what it isn't, why you should care. Um, we're going to talk about Brian's journey, which is fascinating in moving from statistics, data analysis and data science to infrastructure. Going to break apart a few things, the difference between Kubernetes, Docker and other moving parts such as Terraform. Um, how to understand the life cycle of a Kubernetes project and what the core concepts of deploying Kubernetes workloads are. And then we're going to take, uh, Shri's going to take some generative AI code um, because mm -hmm. it's 2023. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we want to we want to be surfing the crest of that that wave. Um, also, um, it's, it's particularly relevant because for a lot of generative AI stuff, AI stuff you need GPUs, right? And this is, mm -hmm. this is a, a, a good way to provision your GPUs. We're going to deploy this generative AI code um, to a Kubernetes cluster, yep. scale, it, scale it out and, and, and schedule it. Um, the other thing, I'm looking at my notes and I haven't written Kubernetes everywhere. I've written K8S in a lot of places. Right. Um, right. And that confused me initially. And that's just a shortening of Kubernetes. And a lot of people say Kates, right? Is that right? Yes, they do. They do. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it's, I mean, the naming, the 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 conventions people use uh, it it's kind of you know uh, it's taken a life of its own uh, another thing you'll hear about is something called cube ctl or i call it cube ctl some people call it cube cuddle it's basically I'm, a I'm command line cuddle. Cuddle. i mean yeah, yeah it's yeah, yeah it's, it's a <laughs> command line tool for interacting with your kubernetes clusters but uh, or a command line tool for interacting with your kates cluster uh, yeah <laughs> so, so it is um, it's very interesting how you know it, it has evolved i think one of the reasons why I think it has all of these different types of naming and um, you know conventions that have come across is simply because the, the the size of the community. There are so many people who kind of sort of eat, sleep, breathe Kubernetes that that of course everyone will come up with their own way in which they are comfortable with you know mm. talking about it, discussing it, um, or writing about it. I'm sure K8S became a thing simply because people were too lazy to type K U B E R N E B E S. It's a long word. So, yeah, it is. It is. So, yeah. So, I'd love, before jumping into Brian's story and the movement from statistics to infrastructure, I suppose I'd, I'd love both of your thoughts um, on why a scientist, machine learning engineer may be interested in Kubernetes and infrastructure to begin with and why they'd want to learn more. Sure. Um, I think it's kind of natural to um, kind of be working on a local machine and then, um, you know, want to kind of do something with a little more horsepower. So like, and it's just cool to like SSH into an instance and, and mess around. So there's like the, the cool guy factor of it, cool person factor of it. Um, but it's really just solving problems that you're facing, you know, working locally for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> just to kind of sort of take that horsepower analogy a little further, like it's almost like, you know, think about like driving a car. Like, you know, you have, I have a car. I, I can 
simply say, I don't need to know anything about the internal details and functioning of the car. I just go in, start it, put my foot on the on, on the gas or what is, on accelerator and move ahead and that's it. Use the brakes, like use those three or four interfaces I have and that's about it. But there are going to be times when it will be helpful if I knew what is happening behind the scenes. And the deeper I go, the more I'll know about it. It's up to each of us to figure out how much deep deep we want it we want to go into it and you know so it depends like how many how much inter, how much do people need to know about or how much do data scientists need to know about kubernetes it depends sometimes they might be just better off saying you know i'll just use add kubernetes give it like cpu equal to 5 and memory equal to 20 and that's it or i could go deeper and kind of sort of explore more and figure out where what can i do with it um to each his own i don't think any there's any one size fits all answer to this so, you know, this is, uh, but it's, it's very, very interesting. It's very powerful for sure. So you can, you can go from like, you can use the vehicle just as a way of going from point A to point B, or you can use it to kind of sort of go, you know, uh, participate in a race uh, or, or, you know, build other things with that or do other things just because you have the ability to move fast from one place to another. So, yeah. And I think um, having kind of the, the infrastructure knowledge of like knowing kind of what hardware and like, what pieces your code's actually running on gives you as the author of the Metaflow job or any data science work, a lot more kind of peace of mind and knowledge just about how your code is gonna run. So um, I think just having that kind of latent in infrastructure knowledge is really good. Yeah, I, I like that. And I do these ideas, I mean, because the rabbit hole, you know, in the words of, Lawrence, I can't remember what the quote from the matrix, but the rabbit hole goes really deep, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. knowing where to stop is, is important, but at least those first layers, um, being able, you know, as Brian pointed out, to do something locally and then being able to leverage Kubernetes clusters. As Sri mentioned, being able to use decorators such as Metaflow provisions, mm -hmm. um, like at Kubernetes that we'll show later, that's, that's a first step. But in terms of being able to like have a bit, as Brian pointed out, a bit more peace of mind around what's happening, the ability to debug and have some understanding about what's going on there and understanding the life cycle of a Kubernetes pro project and what what Docker is and Terraform and all, all, all of these things are. Those are the first few layers going down into an understanding, which I think does give you that, that, that peace of mind. Um, and also, I think a not insignificant aspect of this, which is probably one more point, is that... Um, it allows you to chat with your platform engineers about what, <laughs> what what's happening more and un, un, understanding their their take on things. And I do think the more shared reality and shared understanding between platform engineers and and, and data scientists and ML engineers, um, the you know the happier the the data org and engineering teams will will be as as well. Um, so with all that having been said. Um, I, I just love, you you know, my background, I love your journey, Brian, because my background is in uh, research science and statistics in biology and, and biophysics and, and that type of stuff. I've, I have never dove as deep into infrastructure as, as you have, but the, the journey from the R programming language to, you know, there are all types of things said about the R. I'm, I'm a huge fan of R in, in, in a lot of ways, but there are all types of things said said about it that wouldn't necessarily lead to one thinking there's an obvious journey from R to infrastructure. So I'd love, and I'm sure a lot of people would love to know um, more about this, this journey from statistics um, and R to Kubernetes and, and infrastructure. So maybe you can tell us a, a bit about that. Uh, sure, yeah. So I kind of had the traditional data science background of like, kind of went to grad school for a flavor of stats did like it's mostly like research methods stuff uh, and then kind of entered the workforce without any um, actual skills. So then I had to kind of like pick up SQL at kind of the first job and then um, kind of really fell in love with R um, and um, just allowed me to do a lot of things. Um, and I didn't really pick it up until after grad school actually, but um, Kind of... And what were you using it for? Because in my, I used to use R a lot for, I mean, 
analytics, visualization, and dashboard building. They're the three things that I found it particularly useful for. I know a lot of people use use it for machine learning and that type of stuff, but that's what I, what did you find it most useful for? Um, just kind of data munging and just, I kind mm. of really liked how the RStudio uh, IDE was set up for data analysis tasks. Uh, mm. It seemed like a very kind of natural uh, thing. And then kind of over time, R has just, kind of maximize kind of usability when it comes to doing data analysis tasks. So mm. the whole kind of tidyverse world um, makes things really easy to kind of express things, um, you know, with R more so than uh, Python, I think. I think it's like a yep. lower period entry these days for sure. Were Great. there any so specific, this... specific types of data that was particularly better suited for kind of you know uh for munging with r or analyzing with r was mostly yeah. numerical data tabular data so uh you kind of do there's like a rabbit hole with r too like in terms mm. of performance like um so like pretty soon i don't know if it's still the case i'm kind of far removed from from r these days but um back then you know you basically had to, like a package called data table that was very kind of low low level and super fast and, and efficient for uh any sort of data processing and then there was kind of the deep plier world um it kind of did you know whatever so Got it. Okay. Cool. um but kind of continuing on um i uh was living in LA at the time and kind of like working in Malibu and had this really magical drive and did not really want to move to San Francisco. Uh, um, but I was hit up by a recruiter um, at a company called Adroll um, and um, want, and the uh, first had the first phone screen with uh, Vile, uh, kind of one of the co-founders of outer bounds and mm -hmm. uh, really kind of came interested in in making the move and actually took the interview initially just to uh attend like a r meetup that had uh hadley wickham and joe chang who are like the beatles of the r community yeah um but kind of uh took it to go to the conference or the the meetup but then kind of really became a into the idea of working with with Vile. so like um kind of made the moves to san francisco and started working with him for about four years um and did things with r that um were probably not not a lot of people were doing at the time so a lot of like a lot of etl was kind of done in r and luigi um and then <clears throat> uh kind of moved to netflix um to actually write the first R interface to Metaflow. Um, so, and then uh, at the same time, I was kind of nights and weekends working at, on a, a side project. Um, so when um, uh, Netflix uh, sent me to use R in Brisbane to actually make the first talk about Metaflow publicly at uh, um use r i kind of uh made that the um jumping point to kind of work on my startup full time so um kind of did a bootstrapped out of my bank account uh kind of thing but luckily had um 50,000 in aws credits and then like 30,000 in digital ocean credits so had like a perfect storm of i really have to build this infrastructure um and then to like not have the company fold and then mm. also eighty thousand dollars to like play around with and uh so i don't think like a lot of people kind of have that uh mm -hmm. so it really let me kind of go deep and not worry about you know making mistakes right away so uh, <clears throat> it, it sounds like there were a lot of forcing functions for you to move from mm -hmm. Statistics and you know basic R well R programming skills to doing more software engineering in, in infrastructure stuff. But I I suppose what I think there's some like I've definitely had anxiety and fear as a as a scientist and data scientist. Like I'm 
I still have internalized, I'm not a real programmer. I can't understand infrastructure in the way real software engineers do. So how, how, how did you get through that? If that was even an anxiety you, you had, I, I, I suppose. And what type of technical things did you have to pick up and understand? Yeah, so I had like a lot of exposure to um, the tools from kind of my time at, at AdRoll where I um, had a lot of exposure to uh, like Terraform um, kind of back then. Um, so I was familiar with the tools and then um, kind of when I had to use them, um, I just, you know, really kind of dove deep and then uh, had the luxury of, you know, a lot of uh, wiggle room when it came to the cloud budget. Um, but um, it was just something that kind of clicked and um, I really went for it since I kind of had to. Um, so I didn't have a plan, backup plan at the time if the uh, startup didn't go well. And what, <laughs> so I, I want to jump into details of Kubernetes in, in, in a second, but I, I, I suppose what were, if somebody were going were to go into this journey now to move from analytics to infrastructure, um, what were some pain points or things you learned that could help help them yeah. essentially? Um, so um, yeah, I would say the tooling now is a lot better um, kind of than back then. Um, so uh, I kind of and and just the projects in general are a lot more mature. Um, but in terms of uh, advice, I would uh, probably ask them why. <laughs> I don't know if I would really encourage them to uh, kind of go that low level right away and probably mm. leverage a lot of the the higher level functionality of, you know, hey, um, I want to kind of deploy this thing that has this Helm chart. You know, how can I change the, the values here to like, you know, manage my infrastructure. So like, um, I think there, there's a higher level entry point. And even then you don't necessarily know, have to know uh, much about the Kubernetes API. Um, yeah. So let's jump in and talk about what Kubernetes is and, and, and what it isn't. And then we can jump in to think about what Kubernetes is, Terraform, Helm charts, Docker, all of these different, different, different types of things. But yeah, maybe, each of you can can tell me what Kubernetes is and and, and what it isn't. Shrey, perhaps you'd like to. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so you know the way to think about it, I think, is is to kind of you know start from the fact that you have an application, or any engineer, any developer will have some source code, right? Like you have some source code, and more and more is the case nowadays that your source code depends on a bunch of libraries and few other dependencies, and all of these are versioned. So now your goal is to be able to kind of sort of package all of this together so that it, it can be run on your machine or in some like on a remote machine or for on your like, you know, colleagues laptops, maybe, or on some cloud provider or wherever. But the goal is to be able to put all of these things together so that your application is ready to be to be executed. And mm -hmm. when that happens, like the, this was actually a serious problem because different people would have different library versions and whatnot. Docker kind of sort of was one thing that came together and said, you know what, we can package all of these things together into kind of sort of one big zip file or tarball that, you know, you put in, you give us a file, you in that file, you put in all the dependencies that you want. What are the versions that you want? And, and we'll give you a tool that kind of packages that, all these dependencies, your source code, and or your binaries, whatever it is, all of that together into one tarball and we'll call it a Docker container or a Docker image rather. So that's the first step, that's what Docker does. And then Kubernetes came up and said, you know what, once you have these Docker images, you want to run these Docker images. You want to run these Docker images maybe five at a time or seven at a time or one at a time. And these Docker images will, like any most other software applications, you need a config file or you need a secret. So Kubernetes came along and said, we will orchestrate these Docker containers for you. So we'll take this Docker image, which is a static file and make it into a Docker container, which is the running entity. And this running, and we'll kind of sort of do this for you, again, based on a configuration that you give us. You tell us that you want to run 
five replicas so i will run five instances of this you tell me that i want to scale it down to one replica i will terminate four of them and just keep one of them running so kubernetes came up and said we'll do all of this orchestration for you and we'll give you these other additional features of making sure that you have the same config file that you give to all five instances of your container that are running uh, if tomorrow this config file changes we'll make sure that it gets reflected in all of them if tomorrow you want to delete this config file we'll give you the ability to do that it will give you the ability to see this and so on so that at the very high level this is what it comes down to that you go from i am a developer i have some software that i have written some source code i have written from there to the point of i want to be able to run this at scale or at any scale whether it is small medium large whatever i want to run it with how do i make that journey happen so you kind of make that journey happen using these few tools along the way you use docker for packaging it together you use kubernetes for actually kind of running it in a way that you want it's a very like a high level overview i think i like that a lot what would fantastic you like to add to that version of, that is a fantastic description um so i mean you kind of nailed it so it's kind of um you know the, the orchestrator that uh manages the state that you define uh for the images that you want to run so you know and then for the purposes of this conversation you know just replace developer with data scientist i have yeah. a data science project that i want to go there and there is somewhere yeah. in magical kubernetes um but in terms of like the data scientists, you know, what they need to know, um, I think, um, you know, the they shouldn't necessarily have to know um, how to like configure, you know, the the deployments and, and the services that that their job's running um, and, you know, can work at a higher level until they like really need to to make that that journey downwards. So, yeah. Um I think your explanation was great, Shri, and it, it was so good, it almost made it sound easy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, and, and, and one point that we'll get to is for, for data scientists, actually configuring your clusters and, you know, you've got this wonderful scalability with um, Kate's or Kubernetes clusters, but going from local computation to cloud and back and kind of this iterative loop between prototype and production isn't necessarily mm -hmm. straightforward. And we'll see how that plays yeah. out with more human-centric data science tools such as mm -hmm. um, Metaflow, right? Yeah. Um, just want to remind everyone, we've got a bunch of great comments, but if anyone has any questions, we're very happy to answer them as, as well. Um, we already understand the difference between Kubernetes and Docker, thank you, uh, thanks to Shri. Um, what are all these other things that we hear about? And maybe we'll get to this when understanding the life cycle, but like, We've mentioned Helm charts and Terraform, and what what are a bunch of other things that it would help people to just have a mental model of in order to know what's going on? Yeah, outside of Helm, I don't know uh, because like the Kubernetes kind of uh, ecosystem is massive, so uh, you know there's tools like for templating, like customized, but like. At, a, at the data scientist level, I think just knowing, you know, Kubernetes, um, we mentioned kubectl, I don't know if we did that yet, but it's kind of the, the CLI for it. And then Helm are pretty much the, the first. Uh, so what is, a, what is a Helm chart and what is Terraform as well? Ah, uh, yeah. So Helm charts are uh, basically um, templates for Kubernetes manifests. Mm -hmm. So, um, it basically, um, you know, if you think of it like DBT or any sort of Jinja um, over a bunch of YAML files that define um, a piece of Kubernetes infrastructure. And then Helm just allows you to populate the values with, um, or the parameters with different values based off of your needs. So Helm will allow you to like uh, generate the manifest for a project uh, based off of and, and what's a manifest? Uh, yeah, it's a bunch of YAML <laughs> that uh, kind of defines a uh, part of the Kubernetes API that um, it will uh, when applied using yeah. the so, yeah. 
<clears throat> so just to take kind of sort of Brian's point a little forward, right? Like you think about like what we mentioned earlier that, okay, now you have, let's say you, you had soft, you had some source code, you packaged it into a container. Like, okay, you used a command line tool called Docker and it kind of sort of pointed it to your source code and a few other things. And now you have a Docker image, which is kind of this, like one zip file, tarball, whatever that has all the dependencies that you want. Now you want to run this. Um, and there are different ways to run this, right? Like, let's say like one simple use case to the one simple scenario is that I want to run this in a staging environment and I want to run also run this in a production environment. Okay. So in staging, I want to run maybe just like, you know, a couple of copies just to make sure it's working and so on. Whereas in production, I want to run this at like, you know, I want to run 10 copies of this, of this application because that's where my biggest data set is. And I want to be crunching a lot of data. Now, would I, as a, I mean, one option, of course, when things began, I think many, many years ago, um, people were doing this manually where they said, okay, I'm in staging environment. Let me set some value to number of replicas equal to two, run it here. In some other environment, let me set number of replicas equal to five or 10 or whatever and run it there. The specification for all of this goes into like a config file, which is kind of like a manifest that uh, Brian was mentioning. Mm -hmm. And right. you can say that, okay, staging environment manifest A, production environment manifest B. Now this quickly can get out of hand if you have many applications, many um, uh, many environments, multiple users, many uh, use cases. So that's where kind of sort of things like Helm started coming into picture where they said, you know what, we'll package all of these things for you together. Like you need uh, your application and you need this config, config file and you need like whatever two other components that you require all of them together into this one one thing called a Helm chart. So you had, instead of just one Docker container, now you have Docker container plus few other things together forming a Helm chart. And this Helm chart can then be deployed independently in n different ways. So you can deploy it on cluster A versus cluster B, or you can deploy it three times within the same cluster and so on and so forth. It's basically one layer of abstraction above or on top of containers. So you just kind of sort of packaging it together along with all of its other dependencies and other environment related stuff. Yeah, and uh, examples of, of like Helm charts would be like a Helm chart for deploying Airflow. You know, there's yeah. a Helm chart in the Outer Bounds Metaflow tools repo for right. the UI and the Metaflow service. So it's just the authors of those projects um, define kind of you know, um, templated versions of getting their uh, projects kind of deployed on Kubernetes, you know, with least amount of friction. But um, if you look at an actual Helm chart, it's very hard to decipher with all the kind of templating language in there. So, so one example, so just to take one example of Metaflow itself, the Metaflow Helm chart, for example, there is Metaflow itself comprised of multiple things, right? There is the Metaflow service, which um, there's the Metaflow UI, there's the Metaflow, uh, the Metaflow uses a database. Uh, so now if someone wants to deploy Metaflow, we could go and tell them that follow these instructions one by one, deploy this service and deploy this database and this and that. The Metaflow Helm chart combines all of these together and you can say that, okay, just deploy this one. There is another command line tool called Helm and you can say Helm deploy or Helm install so-and-so and it deploys all the dependencies for Metaflow together so that, you, so that you don't have to go and deploy these dependencies one by one. So, and then you can deploy it in one way in your staging environment and you can deploy it in a different way in the, in the production environment where let's say you want to say that the database for my staging is smaller, but the database for my production environment is bigger those kinds of things. So it kind of combines and puts together these multiple components together uh, in, in one unit. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. You were saying oh, that. no, that was, that was excellent. So, uh, so yeah, so Helm is just uh, interacting with Kubernetes when Kubernetes is somewhere. Um, Terraform is um, kind of a, um, its own language for defining resources uh, based off of different providers. So you would be able to um, deploy, for example, on AWS, um, an EKS cluster uh, running a certain version of Terraform uh, or of, of Kubernetes. And um, so Terraform is for 
the infrastructure and um, Helm is for the Kubernetes resources. So, um, you know, you could take a Terraform uh, module, which is again, like just functions of Terraform HCL code um, that would deploy an EKS cluster. And then you would use a Helm chart to deploy uh, Kubernetes um, uh, resources onto uh, the running cluster. So there's two aspects. One is the kind of baseline cloud uh, infrastructure, and then the other is kind of uh, the Kubernetes resources themselves. Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. I appreciate that. And we've got a bunch of questions in, in the chat, and I don't know if we'll have time to get to all of them, un un unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But one is, um, that I think is interesting is um, uh, Michael's asking, does Docker, Docker has its own cluster management tooling that's competitive with Kubernetes these days? Is that, is that correct? Not really, because, you know, there's a clear winner. Um, I think he's referring to like Docker Swarm, maybe that's yeah. still. I, I would think so. But, uh, yeah. I've actually never heard of anyone reusing it. Um, mm. it there, back uh, maybe three or four years ago, there was, yeah maybe doubt as to what would win, but, you know, Kubernetes is kind of pulled ahead and, um, you know. Yeah, I guess in terms of kind of sort of like, there were multiple different container orchestration engines that kind of sort of came up once Docker containers started gaining steam. Uh, but I, I agree with Brian, like I think just in terms of like the size of the community and the adoption that has been received, I think, uh, Kubernetes is way ahead of uh, any other tools. They may or may, some of them might might be around even if, but even if they do, I think uh, Kubernetes has pretty much become the standard way of orchestrating containers now. Absolutely. Um, another interesting question that maybe we can get to a bit more when we have a demo, um, Shri, um, is yeah. from OC3, should the responsibility of a machine learning engineer, should it be the responsibility of a machine learning engineer to deploy and configure a tool like like Metaflow. Um, my opinion is that that's actually quite challenging. The term engineer is quite overloaded as well. Yes, I think um, a lot of people might think a machine learning engineer is closer to a platform engineer, whereas Thanks. we tend to think that a machine learning engineer is closer to a data scientist. Okay. Um, so the division of labor here is interesting. I personally think that platform engineers need to um, be deploying and maintaining um, the infrastructure behind tools like Metaflow. Of course, um, go to outofbounds.com and, and you'll see that, you know, um, platforms such as Out of Bounds, and by platforms such as Out of Bounds, I mean the Out of Bounds platform um, is a, a wonderful resource if you want, want it to be managed for you by a team who knows exactly what they're doing. Um, I do have a bias there. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a reason I joined the company. Um, but all that having been said, I think maybe it'd be cool to have a, a brief, maybe a five minute conversation, if possible, around how to understand the life cycle of a Kubernetes uh, project, what that looks like. And then we can actually jump into um, some some coding. Unless you think we could do these together, Shri. I'm, I'm good either way. Um, uh, it, it might be... Too. It might be worth kind of sort of going to and seeing what uh, what I have uh, as kind of sort of a demo, and maybe that will trigger some of the conversations, or it might actually answer some of the questions that you have about yeah. how to go about. Uh, and then we can, uh, so we can then have you know, some time left Absolutely. for those questions as well. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> let me quickly share my screen. Absolutely. I may need to make you co-host. Yes, please. And what I'd love in, in not, I mean, in addition to the demo, and it, it, it may just yeah. come out is, yeah, how we understand the life cycle of a Kubernetes project and what the core concepts of de deploying uh, Kubernetes yeah. workloads are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, let me share. Okay. Are you guys able to see my VS Code instance with some Python code in it? Yes. Okay, um, perfect. And perhaps if you want to close the left hand, the file, the file session, sure, sure. and then yes. and then just maximize a bit. Yes. So we can. Does this look better? That's fantastic. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So 
So what I'm kind of sort of going to show here is a, a typical sequence that we've seen um, a data scientist go, uh, you know, when they are using Metaflow, like starting from like the explanation that we talked about earlier about like, I just have some code from there all the way to kind of sort of running it um, in a Kubernetes environment. So in a cloud-based Kubernetes environment at scale for the, for, for giving it as much resources as you want and running it as frequently as you want and things like that. So that's the sequence that we'll try to follow. Uh, and of course, we're going to use Metaflow as a use case for doing this. And within Metaflow, um, since kind of sort of, you know, OpenAI has been kind of sort of the talk of the town for the last several uh, months, I'm going to use one of the models from OpenAI called Whisper. So Whisper is an open source uh, machine learning model for, for uh, use for audio transcription. So given an audio file, Whisper basically converts it from, uh, from audio into text. So you'll get a text output for whatever file uh, that you give it. So in this case, I have a very simple flow. And I'll just uh, add, I'm actually, yeah. we have a couple of wonderful blog posts. Yes. One of which okay. is written by written, yes. written by Shree um, about using Whisper and, and Metaflow. One is um, uh, Whisper and Metaflow. And the other, um, uh, Shree was Whisper. like, oh, let's take this work and, and get it get it working on, on Kubernetes. So then on he Kubernetes. took the work that Eddie Eddie did, and that's kind of some of the stuff we'll be we'll be looking at today. So if you want to check out those blog posts, I put those in the chat as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It was a lot of fun actually doing those uh, about running Whisper on Kubernetes and kind of seeing mm. some of the characteristics of Kubernetes at play there. Um, so yeah, this is this is a very simple flow. There are three steps in it, uh, and so as some of you might be aware of. In Metaflow, everything that is a step is decorated with this at the at step decorator. So we have step one, which is the start, which is where everything begins. Uh, transcribe, which is the second step. So from the start step, we call this transcribe step. Uh, the transcribe step basically uh, loads this model, does the actual transcription, and then it calls the end step. And in the end step, in this case, we're not doing any post-processing of the data. So we just kind of return from here. But it's a very simple, straightforward three-step flow. Uh, we are going to transcribe one file. Uh, this actually comes from, you know, from Australia, from, you know, land down under, from, you know, Hugo is. Uh, and it's a, it's a and it's, two. It looks like it, w it was when Anthony Albanese was the opposition the leader. Opposition. And of yeah. course, he's now the prime minister. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, well, I was actually going to say, you know, what, uh, what the Australian prime minister had to say about Hugo. Uh, but apparently <laughs> not. This is just like some of his, like what, a brief, like one minute speech in parliament. Uh, mm -hmm. about about something. So we're just trying to, uh, but imagine a use case like this, where kind of like, if I'm a data scientist, I just have a problem that I've been told. I have some data, I have some data like this. I have some open source models or open source libraries to use. And I want to kind of sort of experiment with it. I want to see how I can write the code for it, how, how it works and so on. So I write some code like this. And let's say I want to now, and obviously, like when I'm trying to write this code initially, I want to build this locally, run it locally. So I'm writing this code in, in VS Code in my on my local machine. Um, are you guys able to see my terminal as well? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So here, I'm going to just simply try to run this file, uh, starter flow, run. And that's all there is to it. So I write the code, I just run it. It You know, Metaflow is basically doing the, the job of actually running these steps. Uh, one by one. So we are starting it. It says audio transcription, which is the name of this flow. So you can see that the name of this is the audio transcription flow. Uh, it's running each of these steps one by one. So the start step begins. In this case, the only thing we did in the start step was set this URL uh, to a specific fixed value. But you, again, in, in the real world, imagine this URL getting populated from querying a database or going to an S3 bucket or uh, or like whatever other mechanisms you have for accessing the data, you kind of sort of read the data from somewhere, set up these internal variables uh, within this class for actually processing it. Doing the second step, which is the actual processing of the data or using it and doing something. So in this case, the second step, which is transcribe, it began, uh, it did the trans it said it is transcribing. This is the text that it came up with, the actual transcription of that audio into text. This is what came up with basically is a JSON object uh, with the actual transcription and few other things about which tokens there were and what were the confidence scores in these uh, in that transcription and so on and so forth. Uh, and then eventually that task completed the last task, which is uh, the last step, which is the end step started, finished and completed just fine. So I wrote the code. I ran it locally. It seems to work. If I want to tweak this in any other way, I can keep doing this here and there, um, make more additions, make more changes and keep running it locally. And I'm 
happily able to develop and build this code on my local machine, that's a big win. The next step in this evolu- in this process, of course, is let's say I want actually, you know, two things that can happen. One is that there is large amount of data. So instead of this one, you know, two minute file, I might have, you know, a big like a Zoom recording for like an hour. And I want to transcribe that and doing it on my local laptop is not an option because it will mean that I just need too much processing power that I, mo- I may not have. Um, or I could use um, a different model. So in this case, we are using this, this tiny model from Whisper, but there are other models like uh, there is medium, large, extra large, and so on, which have a direct bearing on how accurate your prediction, uh, uh, the audio transcription is. So instead of a tiny model, I might want to use a large model. So for any of these- how, how tiny use, is tiny? Like what, I think it's what? a few, it's a few megabytes. I think it's oh, okay. a few, te- few tens of megabytes actually. Um, is the tiny model. The bigger you go, I think the extra large model is in the in gigabytes or at least yeah. used to be in gigabytes. They've kept on kind of improving it. So I want the same flow to now run on a scalable backend, right? Because I, I don't want, I don't have local resources for doing this. I just want to run this on a, on a cloud-based backend. So let's say one such backend as we've kind of sort of discussed in this conversation is Kubernetes. So I want to run the same thing with Kubernetes and Metaflow makes that super easy. So all I'm doing here is um, in the same flow, I add this additional extra argument which says with Kubernetes. And if I trigger this, Metaflow is doing the heavy lifting almost of actually, and, and of course like there's some setup that happened before where I had access to a Kubernetes cluster set up earlier, but the moment, once that has been done, Metaflow is doing the heavy lifting of kind of sort of taking each of these steps and, and kind of doing the, the, the thing that we talked about, taking them, putting it inside a Docker container, sending that Docker container over to Kubernetes cluster and saying, run this Docker container uh, within the Kubernetes cluster take the outputs of this or I'm sorry, make sure that this step is actually completed. Once this step is completed, start the second step also on Kubernetes. So the same thing here. So if you can see, now let's go back here. This was what we ran with Kubernetes. And the moment we ran it with Kubernetes, the start step, which is the first step, it began. Now, this is some of the nitty gritties of Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, everything that executes is basically a, called a pod. So the start step was basically a pod. This was the name of the pod. So this start step ran as one pod, it completed successfully. The transcribe step began, it ran as its own pod. As you can see, the name of this pod is different from the previous one. So it was a second pod that began, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it did the whole, the actual task is the, still the same. It is still transcribing. You can still see the same text here uh, that was generated or the same output that was generated for transcription. It completed the transcribe step. Then it ran the end step and all of that completed successfully. And Metaflow UI, for example, in this case, uh, if I do this, it will show this how this particular flow actually executed, that it had three steps. You can see the DAG, it had a start step, a transcribe step, and an end step, and the Metaflow UI showed these steps. So without making any changes in the source code, I was able to run the same code I had just remotely on a Kubernetes cluster. So I, as a data scientist, if I'm focused kind of sort of in this world of modifying and tweaking and tuning the source code uh, and use and spending my time doing data science, I was able to do this and do this locally and do this at scale uh, hey, on a scalable back. Yeah, there's, a really, there's a really good question in, in the uh, chat about yeah. how does Betaflow know which image to build? So like, ah, know, that's so a good how question. does it know yeah. The, yeah. that it needs so to that's so that's a that's a good question. So there are two things that can happen here. One is Metaflow by default uses a specific uh, Docker image, uh, so it'll be something like Python three point nine uh, or Python three point ten, depends on you know um, like the version of Metaflow and so on and so forth. But so that's the default image. But I mean, this is where like kind of as sophisticated as you want it to be. If you want to specify a Docker image that you have in mind, then you can actually absolutely do that. So you can do it here on the command line. Uh, I might even have an example of this. Yeah. So as you can see here, you can use on the command line, you can specify which Docker image you want to use. We actually have for the whisper use cases, we have this public Docker image. It's actually mentioned on our uh, blogs. If you want to use those Docker images, public Docker images, you can use that, which already has whisper installed in it, but otherwise you can actually uh, build one yourself and provide the Docker image here. 
Hugo mentioned there, about... And there are, I was just going to add, there are different layers of abstraction, right? So yes. you can specify nothing and it, it does that for you. You can specify a Docker image. You could also specify your dependencies using at Conda base at a flow That's level. Correct. You can specify dependencies at a step level using the at Conda decorator. So it is incredibly modular in that sense. And I think something, the other thing is you've sent this entire flow to the Kubernetes, to Kubernetes cluster. Um, but perhaps in this case, you wouldn't really want to send the start yes. the end step to Kubernetes. You want to send the transcribe step to so you can do at Kubernetes there. And so I, I think what we're really getting at is that you don't need your prototype local code and your production cluster mm -hmm. code, you know, that barely needs to change at all, if at all, which once again, as a scientist who, you know, has spent a lot of time with these types of issues, closing this, tightening this loop, this iterative loop between prototype and production is incredibly important, but then you can go in and the more you learn, the more you can do with this, this type of stuff uh, as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <clears throat> one, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, oh yeah. So one thing that uh, Metaflow exposed there was, you know, the pod ID, um, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily need that um, yeah. if using the UI because the UI kind of exposes yes. everything that you would need. So at this level, I wouldn't think that any kind of Kubernetes knowledge is really um, really required to know kind of what's going on. If you can kind yeah. of follow the path of like, you know, this image uh, is gonna run on a pod, which is just a thing of work. And then, um, you know. That's correct. <clears throat> That's correct. Yeah, you don't need to know about the nitty gritties. All you had to do essentially as a user was to simply, like the way we were doing this was uh, just simply run it with Kubernetes and kind of sort of the heavy lifting of interacting with the Kubernetes cluster, running these and making sure that sequencing is, is correct and so on. All of that gets taken care of by Metaflow. Uh, I also want to kind of go one step further than this. So again, if you think about the journey of a data scientist, I wrote the code, I ran it locally, confirmed that it works, ran it remotely, confirmed that it works remotely. But this is not the experience I want for my day-to-day -day tasks, right? Like if I have a use case, no. I'm not going to be running, you know, every day starting my day with like, Oh, let me run it interactively against a Kubernetes cluster. I want to run this at a fixed cadence. So let's say I want to run this periodically uh, and like submit it to Kubernetes and say that, okay, run this every at every hour. Uh, I don't want to kind of tweak this and run this manually every time. So how do we go about doing that? So Metaflow kind of sort of works at that level as well. So instead of Metaflow has this thing called schedule. So let me copy this uh, and add this schedule. So here we are basically telling Metaflow, that just schedule this every hour. So once I'm confident that my flow is working correctly, I add this decorator instead of hourly, you can set daily, you can set a cron expression for exactly how and when you want to run this. Uh, if you want to know Metaflow and out of bounds actually supports, um, you know, basing these flows or running these flows based on events. So when a new file gets uploaded to S3, trigger this flow and so on. So there is a fair bit of, you know, sophistication available at how you want to trigger these flows. For this example, let's just say that, okay, you want to schedule this every hour and you go back to the command line and all you do is, uh, you can say that all you do uh, is to run Python, start with flow.py, uh, Argo workflows create. So uh, there is a little bit of knowledge that needs to be imparted here, which is <clears throat> when you run these flows on Kubernetes one-off or interactively, it just directly runs it as a Kubernetes uh, job, which runs a Kubernetes pod. When you want to run this, um, based on a, on a certain cadence, we use this Argo open source project. So basically the flow gets converted into an Argo workflows template, and then it runs on the Kubernetes cluster. Again, in theory, you don't need to know about the nitty gritties. Maybe you can just think about this as the command to run when you want to schedule these workflows is to say, you know, Python um, start a flow at pi, Argo workflows create, and Metaflow will do the, the heavy lifting of actually converting it into something that runs periodically. Let me move over to this, uh, to the UI. And I already did that uh, some time back. So you can see here that we ran this audio transcription flow and we scheduled it every hour. And you can see that, you know, it used to run, let's like, say at, you know, 201, 14.01, 13.01, 12.01, 11.01, and so on. So it ran very free at the cadence of every hour once I was able to submit this directly. So. I went from writing code locally 
to having this code running at a fixed cadence or based on specific events by doing very little as in terms of like I was able to spend most of my time hopefully writing more of this code and interacting with the data and tweaking and tuning the actual data science stuff, which is the meat of the matter here. The rest of it, which is how do I run it at scale and whatnot, is, is a matter of like, you know, few commands here and there, and I'm able to up, be up and running. If I want to tweak this subsequently about giving it more resources, using GPUs, for example, like if these audio files are like, as I said, uh, one hour long, it's better off running on GPUs. It is fairly straightforward to actually simply do this, where I just do at uh, Kubernetes, and there's a bunch of documentation around it uh, on the on Metaflow, where we we say something like, let's say I want to give it four GPUs. All I do is I do at the at Kubernetes GPU equal to four, and that's it. I submit my flow again, and it will run with four GPUs. So Metaflow and Kubernetes kind of sort of combine in ways where it is possible to get as many resources as you want, run it in ways that you want, and without having to and a sort of compromise on changing. It's almost like the mental model that I, as a data scientist, want to be in is about data science. I don't want to move from suddenly from the world of data science into the world of infrastructure and talk about YAMLs and Helm charts and whatnot. I, There's I so much cost to that here. type of context, <laughs> context shifting. Yeah, the context the, the, switch should just, be minimal. Mm -hmm. I've actually also just pasted a link, and this is slightly tangential, but it's a, it's a link to how Metaflow, Metaflow's event triggering feature, which is actually yes. quite relevant here because what you've done, Shri, which is wonderful, is you're scheduling this to run every hour. Um, That's right. But with these types of workflows, you may actually want it to be triggered by external events such as when, um, you know, when your data lake or data warehouse is updated at a certain cadence. You, That's right. you, you may, you may want to, you may want that to trigger. You also may um, have um, um, an inference flow which you want to be triggered by the end, by the running um, and end of a, a training flow, right? Uh, and you yes. may have um, a data engineering team who has ETL pipelines. And once you have some data, quote unquote, en engineered, then that to trigger a flow that's owned by a different team. So we can consider yes. these types of things as I suppose, as an API between microservices of, of, of sorts. Yeah. Right? So, um, in if people are interested, you know, here is a very cool idea that, you know, you, we all get onto Zoom calls. Zoom calls get recorded. Zoom call recording goes into cloud. Here is a flow that some that might be super interesting. Trigger a Metaflow flow when a Zoom call completes and is uploaded to some what a Zoom's uh, cloud service. Take that, transcribe it, pass it through some, uh, get the text for it, pass mm. it through some sort of a summarizer, which summarizes the me meeting in say 10 bullet points. Call chat GPT for that. Um, and then send the output of that onto a Slack channel and write this as a Metaflow flow where you trigger it based on an event, which is meeting completed, then do this transcription, summarization, write, uh, send this summary to Slack. So anyone who was in that meeting will get like a five point summary of every meeting. It's a super cool flow, uh, very useful, very powerful. Um, and Incredibly you know, and useful. Fun, so this, fun I, to do. I would uh, add one more thing to that to make it even more fun, which is you can get ChatGPT to take a conversation transcript and rewrite it in the style of The Sopranos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right? So you've got like a bunch of, you know, Tony Soprano and, and, and Paulie Walnut sitting around talking about K Kubernetes. Sorry, so, Brian. Oh, yeah. You yeah, probably so. had something far more <laughs> relevant to. Uh, not as fun, though. Uh, so this yeah. that, um, workflow uh, kind of. Uh, echoes what we were talking about earlier about, you know, kind of the entry point to infrastructure. So, you know, as we're kind of using more features of Metaflow, the abstractions kind of, you, you kind of get lower level in terms yeah, of. That's like, so like, um, you know, starting with the, the GPU, um, now we kind mm -hmm. of need to know a little bit more about uh, where our code is running. And then, you know, if you go deeper into the, the functionality, like the temp FS stuff, mm -hmm. then you really kind of have to know more. And same thing with the scheduling, because now we're bringing in, you know, uh, Argo workflows and with the triggers, Argo events, you don't necessarily need to know what those are, um, mm -hmm. but um, you start to get lower in, in the stack. And then, you know, talking about that, uh, 
event-based architecture, you know, then now you 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 kind of are a data scientist that have some work, but now you want to have uh, build this uh, workflow that involves our, our infrastructure. So that's like kind of the natural entry point of, you know, kind of infrastructure data science folks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would kind of um, recommend, um, you know, we talked about Terraform earlier, um, but um, as much as possible, I don't work in YAML. Um, so I kind of leverage mm. uh, projects that kind of like abstract that away. So for infrastructure, I'm using a project called uh, CDK that um, kind of lets me write code in, you know, whatever language I'm I'm uh, comfortable with, be it like TypeScript or Python. And then um, I'm able to kind of use my regular programming constructs while defining infrastructure. And then I get all of the, you know, amazing IDE support for um, objects. So like, you know, I, I'm not like hunting around documentation as much. Um, mm. <clears throat> so that's kind of like a natural <clears throat> point from like, I have this Metaflow flow and now, you know, I may want to trigger it based off of stuff landing in an S3 bucket or, you know, based off of this snowflake thing updating. So um, that's kind mm. of the next step, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And we have, um. We're gonna to have to wrap up in a, in a second. We have so many interesting questions. Um, for those we don't get to, please come and ask us on, on, on Slack. And I pasted the link in the chat again. Um, we do have a question from Michael Wexler, um, which I think is a very important question um, for what the demo you've just done, Shri. Michael asks, this, this implies that someone did a bunch of work to pre-configure Metaflow and your Kubernetes setup. So how much work is it to pre-configure Metaflow, so it's as easy as what you've done. And actually, someone else also commented, um, "This looks like magic," um, <laughs> which I which well, I really which I which I really like. Um, yeah. But of course, there's there's the Wizard of Oz behind it, right? Who does does all, yeah. the, all the magic? So, what's the work involved? Yeah. So there is there, there are, uh, let me answer this in two ways. So one is uh, one is just given a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, or what's the bare minimum work that you have to do is you need to have a Kubernetes cluster set up and you need to have um, uh, your local machine. So every Kubernetes cluster, sorry, every time you want to access a Kubernetes cluster, there is some, uh, there's a file called a kubeconfig file that has to be downloaded or that has to be generated essentially. Kubeconfig file is basically a file that has the endpoint of the Kubernetes cluster and a token with which you can authenticate against the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, that needs to be done. And in this case, you also needed uh, the Kubernetes cluster to have uh, the Metaflow Helm chart installed. So there is that work. Um, it is it is reasonably straightforward. Although I do admit that it can, uh, if you are trying to do this yourself, give it a little bit of time. Like it's not like run three commands and you're up and running, but uh, it is kind of like that, but it still might need a little bit of effort to just, you know, figure out how do you download the Helm chart, how do you run it, ensure that all the components are up and running. So there is some bit of work that is involved there. Uh, it is doable if you have more questions about it. As always, there are, you know, we are available, most of us on the Ask Kubernetes, sorry, Ask Metaflow uh, Slack channel. So, you know, feel free to come and ask there. In this case, I was actually able to run this, uh, not actually, uh, I was running this on the Outer Bounds platform. So all of that work of actually setting up a Kubernetes cluster and giving you know users access to that and all that is uh, if you have the outer bounds platform, then uh, all of that becomes quite straightforward. Where uh, outer bounds does the heavy lifting of actually setting up the Kubernetes cluster, setting up uh, Metaflow in a way that is kind of scalable, durable, uh, and all as users you have to do. In fact, I might have the UI for this up and running here. So all you have to do essentially is as a user. Uh, so as a user, you have to go here and uh, you download, you install the Autobahns package, you run some of this, this kind of a command where basically this command essentially is Autobahns way of instead of configuring your local machine to have access to the Autobahns platform, uh, to this backend Kubernetes cluster essentially, and then you're up and running. So the platform gets set up by Autobahns. As a user, you run these two commands, which take a few seconds, and that's it. You are up and running, easily able to run any of these flows. And as I said, going from source code to actually running this at scale in fairly straightforward manner. Yeah, amazing. So, I like, oh, yeah. yeah, 
go on. add though is like it's it's and um this is like a feature request uh that i have is it's currently not possible yeah. to um uh, do the <laughs> equivalent of like a pip install for metaflow helm uh um, right so you would have to jump into the outer bounds metaflow tools repo and then kind of know about uh yeah. how to deal with that however if it was, you know, published um, somewhere, then that story would become a lot easier where you would just, you know, help um, pull it from Helm basically. Um, and then um, there's projects that are, are for like running Kubernetes locally, like, you know, Minikube is-, is That's right. Of, so then we would be able to have, you know, a Minikube running on a, your local MacBook, let's say, and then, you know, immediately, uh, Helm install it from um, yeah repo, but you know hopefully that that's coming, but it's not not there yet. <clears throat> um, so it's time to wrap up. We do have one further question, which I think is a great question from Lalith, which is where is your um, Kubernetes cluster and Metaflow running? And Lalith actually says, and maybe you can verbalize this tree is. Um, an architecture diagram that explains the data flow in local versus cloud with Kubernetes would would be useful. Yeah, that's a great question. So in this case, the Kubernetes cluster we have is running on AWS. Uh, it's actually an EKS cluster, um, and uh, that's what, like for example, like when you deploy, when you use the Autobounds platform, you actually it'll create an EKS cluster for you in your AWS account. Um, so it is the user's developer, user's uh, AWS account and, you know, user's data, user's everything. Uh, out of bounds only manages it fully. So that's the, 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 and then the sequence of events in terms of, um, the sequence of data, like we have some of this architecture and, um, details published on the out of bounds website under product. So take a look at that, uh, just to, to give you a high level overview of things. So when we ran this flow. Uh, as I said, you know, each of these is running as pods on Kubernetes. So there is a local kube config. Uh, there is a kube config file that is available for when this flow was actually running. So it was using that to connect to the Kubernetes cluster and sending a kind of sort of each of these steps to Kubernetes, running those steps there, waiting for it to complete, then run, uh, then run the next step and so on. And Metaflow, when it runs on AWS, uh, it also uses an S3 bucket. So all of these artifacts for what it ran, what were the outputs, what were the inputs to each of these steps, all of that kind of sort of gets uh, stored in the S3 bucket. It's a content addressable um, you know, architecture for that storage bucket. So every single, so logs, for example, for each of these steps that you see here on the UI. So you know this, these pods and this Kubernetes cluster might go away, but for each of these steps, when you look at this and you look at the logs for this, the standard output, the standard error, all of these logs will be there forever for you to look at simply because they're actually stored in an S3 bucket. Mm -hmm. So there's an S3 bucket, there is a Kubernetes cluster and Metaflow library is kind of sort of doing the heavy lifting of kind of setting these up and running and configuring them in ways where these things work together. For more details, actually take a look at the website or ping us on Slack and we can, you know, I can have, uh, give more details about it. Fantastic. Um, and look, there are actually so many more interesting questions, but we've, we've, we've gone over time because it's been so fascinating, but I do encourage everyone to join us on, on, on Slack um, and to ask any questions there. And, and I'm just really happy that there was so much engagement because these, these issues are challenging. I've found them scary to, to talk about. And the fact that there is an, an appetite for having these types of conversations means we'll definitely do it again. So uh, firstly, I'd like to thank, um, well, Out of Bounds, for, for, for hosting oh. hosting this. I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining. Um, we had over a hundred people join throughout, which is su super exciting. Um, but most of all, I'd, I'd, I'd love to thank um, uh, both Brian and, and Shri for bringing so, so many years of um, well-earned expertise to this, this conversation. So thank you both. Yeah, it was a lot of Absolutely. fun. Yeah, it was a lot Amazing. of fun, I agree. Wow. Um, great. So everyone, please do join us on Slack and we'll continue the conversation. So thank you once again. All right. Thanks, everyone. And...